Greetings, my mystery mavens. I'm Maytha Ball, your guide to the hidden corridors of history and the whispered legends of power. Welcome back to my blog, where history meets attitude and wonder knows no bounds. Today, we dive into the extraordinary world of our oceans. Discover why we mistakenly named our planet Earth when it's primarily a colossal ocean teeming with life yet shrouded in mystery. Explore the depths where our understanding fades and the secrets of water, the greatest architect of life, remain hidden in the dark. To help us redefine everything you thought you knew about the sea, I've brought along the brilliant Brian. So grab your coffee, fasten your seatbelts, and get ready for some serious celestial wisdom. Brian, the floor is yours. Thanks, May. You always set the stage beautifully. Now, let's explore how these developments will reshape our understanding and what they mean for the future of human innovation. Earth? Seriously, who came up with that name? Grab a globe. What do you see? An endless shimmering sapphire cradling continents like a lover whispering secrets to the shore. This is not Earth, my friends. This is planet water. Our home is a colossal liquid jewel suspended in the velvet void of space. We, the land-dwelling ants, scurry about on its tiny accidental specks of land and with absurd cosmic hubris we name the entire planet after these insignificant grains of sand. It's like an ant clinging to a leaf adrift on a lake, declaring the whole universe the leaf. The irony is galactic and delicious. Water isn't just the backdrop to our drama, it's the stage, the script, the director and the very first actor. Life didn't just happen near water, it was born in its warm, dark, secret embrace. Water is the greatest architect, the most powerful engine and the most enigmatic library on the planet. And we? We know almost nothing about it. It's like living in a palace the size of a galaxy and, well, refusing to leave the broom closet. We sip from the fountain of life but never dare to look into its depths. If space is out there, then the ocean is right here, and honestly, infinitely stranger. Imagine donning a spacesuit to brave the airless void. Now imagine plunging into the ocean. Out there, you'll suffocate. Down here, you'll be crushed like a soda can at a frat party, at depths no human foot has ever touched. Space is vast, yes, but the ocean, the ocean is deep. And that depth isn't just a measurement. It's a wall, a fortress, a silent crushing god. Our satellites, those all-seeing eyes in the sky, can map every pockmark on the moon, every pebble on Mars, but the ocean floor in its entirety? Nope. Not yet. Why? Because the ocean isn't a clear window. It's a thick, murky soup. It laughs at our radio waves and swallows sunlight whole after a few hundred meters. The only thing that even tries to obey us down there is sound. And poor sound, it gets lost, scattered and muffled like a whispered confession in a hurricane. Ah, but what about submarines, you ask? They talk, don't they? Oh, they try. But it's like communicating via two tin cans and a frayed piece of string. Fragile, unreliable and only possible in the shallows. At five kilometers down, you're utterly, profoundly, cosmically alone. Then, in the 20th century, magic happened. We climbed above ourselves and looked down. Satellites changed everything. We thought the Gulf Stream was a mighty, serene river flowing across the ocean like a ribbon on a map. Ha! Ah, from space it revealed itself as a churning, boiling cauldron, a furious dance of countless vortices, giant watery carousels dozens of kilometers wide. Each vortex is its own world, spinning with its own rhythm, its own destiny. The ocean isn't a flat surface, it's an infinite, swirling ballet. This was a revelation akin to discovering the universe isn't made of stars, but of tiny spinning black holes. Before, catching a single vortex meant assembling a fleet of ships, spending months and burning through fortunes. Now, we see them all, dancing before our eyes like fireflies on a summer night. Satellites gave us sight, but only for the skin of the sea. The depths, they remain cloaked in darkness, laughing at our feeble attempts to illuminate them. So how do you study what you cannot see? Enter the heroes, not the buoys that bang against your yacht, but the clever autonomous robots called Argo. They are our underwater spies. For a week, they drift a kilometer down, snoozing like lazy whales, measuring temperature, salinity and pressure. Then, 
as if suddenly remembering their rent is due, they bob to the surface, beam their secrets to a satellite, and dive back into the abyss. Thousands of them roam the seas like a school of fantastical, data-hungry fish, but even they are too few. This is why oceanography is often called, well, the science for the blind. We sort of grope at reality with our fingertips, collecting rare, expensive crumbs of data. We might know the temperature to the hundredth of a degree, but honestly, we have no clue how many alien creatures are doing the backstroke below us. We can predict the weather a week out, but you know, we can't tell you where the fish will be tomorrow. The atmosphere is transparent. The ocean, on the other hand, is an impenetrable, poetic, and frankly, wildly expensive mystery. We like to think the ocean is a bubbling cauldron of life. In truth, most of it is a vast, blue, and utterly lifeless desert. Why is that? Life needs two things, sunlight and, well, food, biogenic elements like nitrogen, phosphorus, and silicon. Sunlight barely penetrates 100 meters, and the food, it sinks. Dead things pull it down, down, down into the abyss. The surface, starved of nutrients, becomes sterile. Life thrives only where there's a delivery service. Maybe it's a river dumping its mineral-rich cargo from the land. Or perhaps it's a place where cold, deep waters, heavy with minerals, surge upwards, zones of upwelling. These oases, they cover less than 1% of the ocean's surface. This is where the fish frenzy happens, everywhere else. A magnificent, silent and empty stage. And the seafloor? Oh, it has its own magic, a whale falls. And for years, a city springs up around its corpse, populated by zombie worms that have been napping for decades, just waiting for this gourmet meal. Or oil drillers start poking holes, and scientists rush in to see who's living a kilometre under the seabed. Yes, you heard right, life exists even there in the stone-cold dark. Some say the biomass of these hidden underground microbes might outweigh all other life on Earth combined. We live on a thin crust, blissfully unaware of the invisible gargantuan world writhing beneath our feet. Now let's talk ice. Ice is our friend. It's on the surface. We can see it from space. We can poke it with a stick and it holds the keys to destiny. Take the Arctic. Why does it freeze solid while the North Atlantic stays stubbornly liquid? It's not just the Gulf Stream, darling. It's the rivers. Lena, Yenisei, Obi. These titans pour fresh water into the Arctic Ocean. Being lighter than salt water, it spreads out in a thin film, and this film, it freezes fast, forming strong, fresh ice. Without these rivers, the Arctic as we know it, a frozen kingdom, might not exist at all. There was even a mad plan to divert Siberian rivers southward. The result? The northern sea route would be ice-free. Genius? Absolutely. Feasible? Thankfully, no. Nature has a way of swatting away our clumsy, god-playing hands. Why is our planet just so? Why is there exactly enough water to drown the shells, the shallow edges of continents, creating the perfect cradle for life, coincidence, or a delicate cosmic balance? Imagine an Earth with half as much water. All our shelves would be dry land. The oceans would be deep, dark chasms separated from the shore by sheer impassable cliffs. Now imagine twice as much water. Only the highest mountain peaks would remain, tiny islands in an endless blue. We'd be alpine hermits gazing out at a world without horizons. But the most thrilling thought, other worlds. The James Webb Telescope has already found exoplanets whose atmospheres are practically dripping with water vapor. These are ocean planets. And on one of them, perhaps, scientists have detected dimethyl sulfide, the very molecule that gives the sea its scent produced by living organisms. This isn't proof yet, it's a promise. There's a promise that somewhere out there, in the endless dark, Another unknown life is splashing in its own private sea. And well, closer to home, orbiting Jupiter, lies Europa, a moon hiding an ocean beneath ice dozens of kilometers thick. In the 2030s, probes will land on its frozen skin, searching for traces of organic life. Our ocean is honestly an eternal engine. It will never freeze completely. Even in the snowball Earth eras, when ice gripped almost the entire planet, life clung on huddled around hydrothermal vents in the crushing, warm dark. It survived the oxygen apocalypse. It survived global deep freezes. It is, without a doubt, the ultimate survivor. We spend billions on submarines, mapping currents for their stealthy passage, charting gravitational anomalies so they can hide in plain sight. But the life of the ocean, its very soul, 
We study that on scraps, on leftovers, on the kindness of grants. And yet despite the pressure, the darkness, the silence, the ocean still calls, it is our second cosmos, and understanding it won't take just one generation, it will take many, many more. So come, explorers, dive in. Our blue planet is waiting, and you know it has no intention of making it easy for you. And there you have it, my lovers of the labyrinth. Remember, every challenge is just a stepping stone to greatness. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, so we can keep exploring together, and drop a comment to share your thoughts. Until next time, stay curious, stay bold, and keep chasing those dreams.